Club, and it is time for me to start. Um, I am Kelly Alsup. I'm an Extension Educator in Horticulture for University of Illinois Extension. I am based out of Bloomington, but I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. And this fall, I got to do a really cool PowerPoint on mysterious modifications, plants that grow in unusual ways. Um, I was telling Kari earlier, it was really fun to do the research for this. Now that it, now it is hard for me to look at a plant without thinking about what adaptations it has made to survive in our environment. So hopefully you will be left with that same kind of sense of wonder. Okay, what does an adaptation mean? Uh, it, it is something that, uh, some characteristic that the plant has that enables it to be successful in um, the particular environment it's living in. Um, for instance, you look at this cycad on the right, um, there are spines, and so it actually prevents animals from eating it. These characteristics evolve over long periods of time. It doesn't happen fast, um, and it's sort of a process of natural selection. Um, adaptions are all about um, getting more resources, whether it be sun, water, air, or nutrients. Prevent them from um, getting eaten. So, uh, and then, um, and then it's always about reproduction. How how can they help themselves reproduce and be, be prolific? So I'm just going to go straight into it and start talking about some adaptations and some of the plants. Um, this right here is a sundew, and it is a carnivorous plant. And carnivorous plants are plants that actually use insects to get their nitrogen, their phosphates, and their potassiums. And they usually are growing in an environment like a bog that is very acidic. Um, so because of the acidity, acidic nature of the bog, it actually does not favor the growth of the bacteria need for uh, nitrifying. So nitrification, excuse me. So these plants are unable to get these nutrients. They're still photosynthesizing and getting food in that way, but they need the nitrogen, the phosphate, and the potassium to help aid in making that food. Um, so how they have adapted? They've adapted to using insects to give them that. And actual, actually, um, uh, when I was a plant biology greenhouse um, grower, um, we were not able to fertilize these at all because they did not respond well to fertilizer because they have adapted to only use insects. Um, and then we always used a special kind of water on these sundews and coniferous plants because some of the water that um, some of the nutrients in a water, for instance, like calcium or fluoride, um, these coniferous plants were unable to handle and they did not thrive. Um, this particular sundew secretes a, a liquid on its um, on these little hairs and it attracts the insects and then these small insects get caught in the leaf and if you look closely right here are two little fungus gnats and then the leaf will actually curl around the insects and secrete enzymes that break down that insect and digest those nutrients so even though this plant doesn't look very menacing, it will eat a bug or an insect. Um, we also have um, Venus flytrap. Um, 
unfortunately the image is not here this is pitcher plant but we also have a venus flytrap and you guys remember seeing these in the movies and they're really they're actually much smaller than you see in the movies and um we grew them in the plant biology greenhouse actually the kids absolutely loved these um, again these venus flytraps um they they close like a book and they're the insects are attracted to them by that sticky liquid and um uh then the hairs on each side of the venus flytrap are triggered and that uh triggers the closing of the the full leaf and then the insects are trapped inside that closed um sort of book of leaves and they're pressed against digestive glands and it, it takes a little bit for them to di digest them down but um, we would um, you know we would try to get the the kids not to um, uh, do too many of these because the kids like to rub their finger down the midrib and it close up right in front of them and they were in awe but that would stay closed for a little bit and we didn't want um, too many of them not to have um, the ability to trap insects that day but um, an interesting thing about uh, Venus flytraps is they can distinguish between inanimate objects and in that both hairs on each side of that, those leaves must be touched in succession for it to trigger the closing. Pitcher plants, oh, I love pitcher plants. I've probably killed a million of them. And the reason why is because, yes, they are adapted to bogs. They are adapted to, you know, the right water. We only used uh, reverse osmosis water. Um, and um, so they, it, it was hard to grow them inside sometimes. But we grew them in a greenhouse and they thrived. It's a, this is a vining carnivorous plant. It actually lures the insects with the sweet smell of, of nectar or the promise of water because inside these little pitchers, there will be a mix of water and digestive liquids. The rim is really waxy, so when the insects come up to the edge, they will fall in. And then the interior walls actually have downward facing hairs, so it makes it very difficult for them to come back out. And in fact, the struggle will trigger a greater excretion of digestive liquids with this, um, with, with the pitcher plant. So they'll actually produce more digestive liquids when they know they have an insect inside that pitcher. And some of the, you know, these are rather small. They're maybe four or five, six inches, and they can be from six to 16 inches. And even in um, some tropical areas, um, these rather large pitchers can uh, digest larger things other than insects like frogs. My next plant updatation is prop roots, and everybody's seen prop roots before. If they live in Illinois and they've seen corn, we know corn is a monocot and it has very shallow roots, so it produces these prop roots, actually stem tissue, to hold the corn up in the wind and make sure it stands straight up. Well, in the mangrove, which is a plant from Florida, it actually not only serves as this plant for anchor, but it actually allows the plant the ability to aerate itself because mangroves live in salt water. So that, you know, living in that kind of harsh environment, they're not allowed to um, get air um, from the water the way they would if it were fresh water. So these actual um, prop roots are allowing them to aerate themselves. And then if you've gone anywhere in Illinois or the southern part of Illinois, you've gone, you've seen these beautiful cypress trees. Um, I'm always in awe when I see a cypress swamp because it's lush and green and then you see these gigantic knees. And even though this is not salt water, 
this is uh, they are water you know the the soil is waterlogged and unable to aerate itself this is another way that this tree can get air to its roots and throughout the tree and then right here I have a picture of the state champion um, the roots are all around you actually see them back here but then here you see these knees these these prop roots that come up and help aerate their knees not prop roots okay okay then orchids the orchid plant is actually one of the most complex flowers that we have most advanced and these um, mo the majority of the ones that you buy from the store uh, a phalaenopsis or a, a cymbidium are um, epiphytes and an epiphytic plant actually grows in the crotch angles of trees and it really doesn't require soil to grow another example of these may be bromeliads or ferns so what happens is you see these white roots they actually have um, what is called velamen on them and these are multiple later multiple layers of photosynthetic material um, so if you ever see um, an orchid being sold in a clear pot they're actually um, doing that for a reason because those roots are actually photosynthesizing too and then the roots make a, a very thick mat and then soil and debris gets collected in there and then it helps uh, keep and collect water so uh, the roots are actually are really quite beneficial a lot of people want to cut them off um, but um, they are helping the plant photosynthesize and then another thing about an epiphyte it not being directly in the soil and keeping itself as hydrated because it's probably going to be um, up high in the trees with wind and sun um, it actually does um, a different kind of photo, kind of photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis and what happens with C4 photosynthesis and succulents do this too and I'll talk more about that later they open their pores at night instead of during the day usually plants are driven to open their pores by the Sun during the day but these do not they open their pores at night and they're actually avoiding water loss so at night they're still absorbing the co2 and emitting the oxygen but they're turning that co2 into an acid that they can use during the day for photosynthesis and making food and it's a really great cool thing for them to do because otherwise they probably wouldn't survive and they wouldn't stay as moist as they would like um, again uh, in the greenhouse orchids were another plant material that we would do our reverse osmosis water with um, distilled water because they did not respond very well to like the calcium and the fluoride in our normal tap water okay now we have Spanish moss now Spanish moss is not Spanish nor is it moss it's actually a member of the pineapple family and it absorbs the nutrients through the leaves rather than roots so it absorbs the water and the nutrients um, it grows in the south it usually likes more humid conditions obviously because it doesn't have roots and then because it's absorbing water through air it actually um, can be rather um, susceptible to uh, pollution um, this is a lot like you know the lichens that we may have on trees um, that um, you know it's like a 
greenish fungal growth, it's actually a good indication that you have very little air pollution. And in fact, in Illinois, lichens, 50 years ago, there weren't very many lichens around, and now they're actually coming back because our air is cleaner. So um, even though Spanish moss is not a lichen, nor is it a moss, it is a plant, but it does not have the roots. It absorbs its water through the leaves. Um, another one of my favorite um, plants with cool adaptation is an earth star. It is a bromeliad. However, it's not an epiphyte. It does grow in the soil, which we call terrestrial because it can't handle um, too much sun. It actually wants diffused sunlight. But the way that it has um, uh, adapted to conserve more water is anything with a waxy leaf is really trying to do that, trying to conserve water. And then um, another thing is that um, it has the cup in the in the middle, and as it rains, it actually keeps that water around, and it can actually keep the water around for several days. So the plant can actually get water to its roots when it uh, even on dry days. I have a question. What specifically is it that prevents the mangrove from getting air? Well, because of the salt water, it actually makes it anaerobic conditions. So they're unable to get oxygen. So that is what's presenting. And the same with a bog. Um, it is an anaerobic condition, so they're unable to get oxygen. So that's what it is. Uh, drip tips on rubber plants. I love rubber plants. They're one of my favorite. And actually, even though not a lot of research has been done on interior scaping, rubber plants are uh, supposed to be one of the plants that produce the most oxygen. So if you're going to choose any type of plant to put in your office, um, a rubber plant is definitely a good choice. But um, obviously, you can tell by looking at these, rubber plants are not from uh, America. They're actually from the tropics. And tropical plants, they tend to have much larger leaves because they have a lot of competition. And they're trying to catch as much sunlight as possible. But again, in the tropics, you can have as much as 80 inches of rain a year. And these drip tips, and you see them at the very tip, they're just a little point. They actually allow that water to be shed. Otherwise, there would be fungus growing on it. And then it also has sort of a secondary way of shunting the water towards the roots. Sensitive plant. Um, this is a huge favorite among the kids, too, because, again, you go and you, you, you pull your finger down the midrib, and that sensitive plant will curl up and collapse its leaves and close its leaves up. And um, it's actually um, a release of water. It's, it's a re it uses Tuger pressure to do that. And it will do this not only when it's touched, it'll do this in the heat of day or really windy. I mean, obviously, in the heat of the day and wind, the heat, it doesn't want to lose that much water. The wind also is a way for it to not lose as much water if there's much less surface area there. In addition, the closing up, yes, is to deter insects and animals. Insects may just be scared off by it. By move, quick movement, an animal may see it as not um, that great of a food source because it will look much smaller. Um, it also, when it closes up, if you look closely at the stem, um, it makes these thorns more visible. So again, thorns are another way a uh, animal would 
not necessarily want to eat this plant. And then um, it can also be another way to allow water to run off. Uh, Jabata Kaba tree. Why in a million years did I pick Jabata Kaba tree? It's from Brazil. Well, we had one of these in the Plant Biology Conservatory, and it was one of my most fast, our most fascinating plants because it flowered on the bark. Not something that we see here in Illinois. This is actually called cauliflory. And so you ask, why would a tree flower on the bark? Well, it there could be many reasons. One is it, the flowers don't want to take up you know, the space where leaves can be photosynthesizing. Another thing is it can attract pollinators. This is an understory tree, so it can attract pollinators in the low uh, understory of an actual uh, forest. And then look at those big, large fruits. It actually, uh, the trunk, it can hold on to those big, large fruits uh, much better than limbs or branches. And then also seed dispersal. They are actually called the grape tree because people um, are actually growing them as ornamentals in California and Florida. And um, it is, it, I actually definitely have eaten several of them. I don't know if I would eat them like grapes because it's kind of the consistency of yogurt and the taste of grapes. But um, it is definitely a surprise when you walk into the conservatory and you see all these beautiful black um, berries on the bark of a tree. Um, then I have uh, uh, Kalinkoe, and I'll talk more about succulents later, but I have this starfish plant. Um, again, this is another one we grew at the Plant Biology Greenhouse, and it was fascinating to see these flower because um, to us, they're, you know, great big starfish, and they're very impressive looking, but they have adapted very well to their surroundings. So you may look at this and say, oh, it's a pretty starfish, but to insects and pollinators, this looks like rotting flesh. It has the texture, the color, and it actually has the smell. So it is attracting uh, carrion flies. And then it also actually is protection from animals because they're not going to be attracted to this plant, whether eating the flowers or eating the foliage when it smells like this. Succulents. Uh, I love succulents. Right here is a panda plant. It's a kalinkoe. And it is using these dense hairs to prevent water loss. Another thing about succulents is they're rather shallow rooted. So if you've ever heard a horticulturist say, keep them in small pots, keep them root bound, this is the reason. Um, because they have adapted to hurrying up and absorb the rains before evaporation occurs. Another thing about succulent is they're really slow growing and they are slow growing for a reason. They reduce water loss when they don't grow quite as fast. Um, and then another reason horticulturists will tell you to put them together is because the roots actually stay in small compartments and they don't have too much to mine. Um, you would never want to see um, you put just one succulent plant in this rather large pot. You would want to do a group of them or keep the pots small. Um, uh, when people ask me about potting up succulents, um, my rule of thumb is if you can knock out the pot and you hardly see any soil left, then it's probably ready to be potted up. But you're not going to pot it up too much. You're going to maybe go from a four to a six inch pot. But if you still see soil, 
you're fine. I let it stay until you think that it it needs new soil. They also um, succulents. If you've ever rubbed them and they have this white waxy coating that comes off on your fingers that is called bloom and it's actually kind of like a sunscreen that reduces evaporation um so it's real i love uh showing these to the kids and having them rub it off and ask them what they think it is and most of the time they do come up with sunscreen and so this is because succulents come from really really arid environments but be careful because some succulents are okay in full sun and some succulents are not um i call succulents the bedroom plant and that is the reason because they too do the C4 photosynthesis, meaning they're going to be releasing oxygen at night. So what better than to have succulents in your bedroom when you're sleeping when you actually need the most oxygen? So I looked up a study, excuse me, <coughs> that found that um, they were suggesting that you put mother-in-law tongues in your bedroom to um, have the benefits of oxygen, but they wanted you to have four rather large plants. So if um, you're thinking about, you know, decorating your bedroom, this might be uh, a great one to have those added benefits of oxygen. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Weltwichia. I'm sorry. Okay, um, so why would I bring, what, horticulturists are probably going, why is she bringing Weltwichia into a, into a plant adaptation lecture? Because quite honestly, this plant has not changed for 140 million years. You'll actually find this plant at the, in the coastal desert of Africa. And it's a plant that only grows two leaves. Now, if you see more than two leaves, it's probably because the one of the leaves has split. And it is a gymnosperm, like um, conifers, which means it naked seeds. So it has separate male and female um, cones. But what's interesting in how this is adapted to such an arid climate is that the stomates close during the hot weather and they open on cloudy or foggy days. And in those days, the stomates actually absorb water. So it is obviously a great adaptation to have if you are on the coastal desert of Africa because you can live a thousand to two thousand years and uh, you don't have to change the way you are for 140 million years. Another uh, really cool tree that has adapted to such an arid environment is this bottle tree in Australia. And the bottle, the bottle look is really just a large cavity. And these are parenchyma cells. And a parenchyma cell is something that can be differentiated into something different, meaning it can form a xylem cell, it can form a bark cell, it can form a heartwood cell. This is um, just, they're, they're, they're able to turn into something else. And these cells are holding lots of water for this tree when it's during the drought. So again, their, um, their adaptations to um, conserve their water and to get more water. Um, I always talk about these adaptations when I talk to master gardeners. Uh, we know uh, roses, obviously, you know, Maybe the prickles, these are prickles and not actual thorns because they are an outgrowth of the stem. Um, yes, they can be for um, um, prevention of being eaten. Then in the middle we have tendrils and this is a way for a plant to climb up 
and photosynthesize and get up in the sun. And then on the right we have cactus and you see the barrel cactus at the bottom. This one, they both have spines so you know in, a, in, a, in a, an envi arid environment where there's not a lot of uh, leaves and food to eat. This is a great way to uh, prevent yourself from being eaten but notice they also have a lack of leaves. So that is uh, preventing these from losing too much water. If they did have leaves they wouldn't survive. And then I um, always put in the bracts um, because uh, I have definitely, being a former greenhouse grower, have grown my fair share of these beautiful red poinsettias. And uh, they were actually one of the most difficult crops I had to grow. But we're always looking for the perfectly... Um, uh, red bracts, uniform, no, no problems, no, 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 uh, no damage at all on these uh, bracts. But, re but uh, actually, you know, these are not flowers; they're bracts, which means they're modified leaves, and the flowers are actually right in the middle. And so why would a plant want to have very colorful bracts? Because, you know, the pollinators may not be able to see the flowers. But because they have these really large colorful bracts, then the pollinator can see it. And actually, being the former greenhouse grower that I am, you usually want to purchase a poinsettia before you actually see the flowering parts. So if you look really closely next time, you'll actually see the yellow flowering parts. And if you see too many of them and they're too open, then you probably want to go to a less mature plant. And the same with the dogwood over here on the right. These are modified leaves. These are not flowers. Um, the flowers are the insignificant yellow balls in the middle. Wild parsnip. Wow, this wild parsnip actually um, took the horticulture world by storm last this last summer. Well, I meant my horticulture world by storm um, because there were a lot of people noticing it. And I think it probably because we had lots of rain and a really good growing season for weeds. But this wild parsnip actually had you know it's known for if you go up and touch it it produces phytotoxic compounds and it can actually really blister your skin and it can be very dangerous um, and it's obviously discouraging you from eating it but this plant has many more adaptations that really make it a great weed um, so it's kind of like a biennial. It may have one or more years as a rosette, but then it blooms under favorable conditions. And um, it'll bloom that, that second or third year. It has a rather large taproot, which makes can make it hard to get out. Um, but it, that's, you know, um, kind of indicative of prairie plants. It bolts really tall to reach the sunlight. It actually has a hollow stem. And so this actually uses less energy than to make a hollow stem than it would to make a, um, a uh, more consistent stem. So, and then it also produces 975 seeds per plant, and it has male and hermaphrodite, which means both male and female flowers on each plant. So it can be a really hard weed to get rid of. Um, so wear gloves if you see something like this. Poison ivy, again, this is another weed that has some great adaptations that um, make it somewhat difficult for um, people to get rid of. Um, it has very tough roots. Anybody that's ever tried to dig up poison ivy or work with poison ivy knows that, you know, 
sometimes you can feel like you got it all and then it'll come back and that's because the roots are really quite tough and another thing is it has really shiny red growth in the spring and this is actually to deter insects um, they'll they'll see a red they'll see the red growth and they will think it's not food and then it actually has the um, Urashal that actually can blister the skin. Some people are not allergic to it. Some people are. Um, in a, the last presentation, somebody was saying that deer eat poison ivy, so it's not. It doesn't affect everybody in the same way. But this Urashal, I just wanted to say, it actually absorbs rather slowly into the skin. So um, when I um, used to work in botanical gardens we would actually go out and work we would come in for lunch and before we did anything we would all go wash with the poison ivy soap and so this poison ivy soap would get that ear shawl off of us before it was able to absorb into our skin and I am very allergic to it and I know I was working around it um, many times and did not get it because I actually used that poison ivy soap. And then another thing is that this poison ivy can grow up a tree along the ground. It's going to go where the sun is. Um, Kentucky coffee tree. Oh, uh, what horticulturist or gardener does not love the beautiful bark on this tree? Um, however, you have to have, you know, a botanical sized garden to have this tree because it's rather large. Um, but it is, it has winter interest like no other. But, you know, usually when you see really thick bark like this, it is to prevent evaporation of moisture. It is to protect the tree during the winters. And actually, deciduous trees, we know that they drop their leaves every winter, and that's because they need to conserve water over the dry winters. And um, they're dropping those, leader, those leaves right at the base of their um, that right at the base of their tree, that way those nutrients, as it's broken down, they're going to be used the next year when the trees have leaves back on them and can photosynthesize. So the white pine tree, this is a coniferous tree, we know this, so that means that those needles stay on year long. Um, it actually has a conical shape, which is something that is endearing to most uh, um, horticultures because it's really quite beautiful in the way that it drapes and so that conical shape and the downward facing of the needles actually allows the snow to shed. This has deep spreading roots to soak up water and this is the reason why you grow white pine and you don't grow blue spruce because blue spruce does not have the root systems to get that um, to, to survive in a place like Illinois and usually we either overwater them or underwater them or they dry out during the winter and uh, they don't they, they don't do very well but white pine is wonderful in Illinois it actually has the waxy needles that um, prevent from water prevent water loss from the drying of the winds. Um, okay, now prairie roots. Um, yes, um, have you ever heard that Illinois has the best soils? Well, this is why, because we have prairies. And they have amazingly deep roots. And they're really, you know, it's more for, it's more than just getting more water and nutrients. Actually, um, if you look at a prairie, more of the biomass is underneath the ground than above ground. And there actually is a lot of uh, um, ecosystems in there. So there's things that are living amongst the ground. 
Um, these can be 6 to 16 feet down. They can be 4 feet horizontal. But one of the major reasons that prairies plants like this have such deep root systems is because of fires. And um, back when we had vast prairies, there would the um, the lightning might hit the ground, start a fire, and then it would um, take down the prairie. And then that's another reason why most prairies don't have trees in them because most of their biomass is in their trunk and they can't withstand, you know, that much loss of energy. Um, but so these these prairie plants are burnt down by these prairies, but if you go back after a burn, in just, you know, a few short weeks, you'll start to see this really quick regrowth. And, you know, maybe even, you know, a month or two later, it's almost like, there wasn't even a burn it's because all this energy is reserved in the in the roots and then it makes for a really quick regrowth of that prairie um, one of my favorite prairie plants is um, this silphium called the cup plant um, it is um, a really cool plant it's actually really tall they bloom in late summer and it uh, it had these leaves converge together and they make kind of a little cup and they actually hold the rainwater and they can hold the rainwater for several days after a rain event and so this is just a way for this plant to keep moisture and uh, you know if you look in a prairie during the late summer there's lots of these silphiums around this is just one of them there's four but this is just one of them and this is a really great adaptation and actually you'll see insects and frogs and birds using these water reservoirs of the cup plant and then even you know back in the day they you know settlers might have used these to have a drink while crossing the prairie then I have another silphium and this is called the compass plant and the reason it's called a compass plant is because the leaves point north and south and that was that was actually another way for settlers to be able to tell which direction they were going but you know this plant is not just you know helping out the settlers it's actually trying to avoid the direct midday sun where it's going to dry out so this is another way this plant is conserving its moisture in a prairie that may not have you know lots of lots of rain um, Another thing I want to talk about, this is my, one of my favorite things to talk about with plant adaptations, is there's a term called pollination syndrome. And pollination syndrome is just that this is the shape, the fragrance, the nectar, or the color that it would attract a certain animal. For instance, the pollination syndrome for a hummingbird is red, Tubular and tubular flowers like a trumpet flower or a morning glory. The pollination syndrome for butterflies would be a landing platform with lots of nectar. For instance, Mexican sunflower or zinnias. In this picture of the foxglove on the left, this is pollination syndrome for a bumblebee. So it not only has a wide open mouth, just the perfect shape for a, a large bumblebee, the reproductive organs are on the roof. It also has these contrasting colors, and these are called nectar guides. And they are telling the bumblebee where to go in the flower. So the bumblebee is going to follow these nectar guides, get down to the nectar, rub its hairy body on the top part. The reproductive organs are on the roof of this um, tubular, of this flower. Uh, and then they're going to go to other flowers. 
And uh, this is a really great way to be able to tell if you if this plant is pollinated by bees, they may have things like this called nectar guides. Another thing that bees use is again that contrasting color. They actually see in UV. So what we see on the left is what they see on the right. So some plants are actually, you know, know that they have the pollination syndrome that allows these bees to see this contrasting color of UV. Um, red trillium, oh, this is a spring ephemeral. Another, another word, ephemeral, to learn. Ephemeral means it emerges quickly in the spring and dies back soon. And there are actually three different kinds of ephemerals. Um, there's spring ephemerals, like this red trillium, that actually maximizes sunlight in the early, early spring before trees actually leaf out. There's desert um, ephemerals, and you'll actually hear stories about desert wildflowers um, blooming for short amount of time and then di all dying back. And then there's weedy ephemerals, and sometimes we see this with disturbed land where a certain weed will really outcompete early on, and then they'll start being com uh, outcompeted by other plants. Um, but this red trillium, um, really quite a sight in the early spring in Illinois. Um, if you live, if you live in Illinois and you don't hike the hike the woods in the early spring, then you're really missing out on some of the best flower displays. But this one, red trillium, it is the pollination syndrome is rather dark, and it actually um, has a foul odor. So it's probably attracting flies. Um, and then after it's been pollinated by the flies, it produces a dark berry. And this dark berry capsule actually has an oily appendage attached to it. And this actually stimulates the insects to gather it and dispense it because an insect like an ant thinks that these oily appendages is, are a snack, and actually they're tasty to them. So this red trillium is really adapted to get its seeds dispersed, so reproduction. Bird's foot trefoil, this is another one, definitely has the pollination syndrome of um, a, a bee. It has lots of nectar, and it has a really interesting way of getting the um, the uh, pollen on the bee's belly. You see there on the flower, um, the nectar lures the bee to land, but they're looking at the top flower and not looking at the bottom flower. However, they'll land on the bottom flower and the weight of the bee opens up this bottom keel petal and it dusts the bee's belly. And then the nectar is at the bottom. So the bee will feed from the nectar at the bottom and get its belly dusted. And this, the flowery, flower parts could not position, be positioned in a more ideal place to get on the, the hair of the bee. Oh, uh, I love these. These are uh, Rothlesia and Titanarum. These are from Indonesia, and they're really quite unique plants. They're not really a gardener's plant, um, but uh, I've definitely uh, have a story about the Titanarum. But let me talk about the Rothlesia first. This is one a very large flower. Um, it is called can also be called the corpse flower it smells like a decay, decaying corpse it attracts um, carrion flies and it's deterring animals um, what's interesting about this flower is it doesn't stay open for very long but this actual plant is a um, parasite and it uses small filaments and it actually 
is a parasit parasite on a chestnut on chestnut vine and it uses these small filaments to get nutrients from that host and so it's adapted to being a parasite on that host so much that it actually lacks the ability at this point to make chlorophyll for itself um, so it, it absolutely has to have chestnut vine around and then when conditions are ideal you'll see this flower um, this Titan arum um, actually we had one in the greenhouse it was very large very impressive and extremely sticky and this flower would attract visitors like no other and we actually had a video camera on it and people from the university could go in and see if the Titan Arum had bloomed yet I think uh, they uh, were looking at the Titan Arum more than they were working but hey it's all about horticulture and it was you know quite a unique plant and it really the flower doesn't last very long um, and it, 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 about, you know, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit less or more than 48 hours. And it, actually, the flower produces a lot of heat. We know that in heat, smells can spread. Um, but we actually, um, after it flowered, it would produce uh, multiple leaves. It's actually a really beautiful plant after it flowers because it has this gorgeous speckled stem. And these beautiful, you know, emerald green leaves. Um, but we would also put this put this plant through periods of dormancy. And the same, you know, that's a, a great adaptation to be able to go dormant and then come back when the conditions are right. So um, half the time, this plant would actually be in another greenhouse room where we did not water it and we just uh, neglected it. And then we would start watering it again and it would actually produce the bloom and then after the bloom it would produce the foliage. Okay, back to uh, Illinois. Milkweed plants. Milkweed plants, uh, we know that a lot of insects have adapted to milkweed plants because they produce toxins. And these toxins avoid this plant from being eaten, but these actual insects from being eaten. <coughs> the roots of this plant grow vertical and horizontal. And anybody that has ever tried to transplant a milkweed knows this. Um, it's definitely one plant that you're going to want to buy as a plant and plant or collect seed if you want. It produces large amounts of nectar. Again, anybody with milkweed in their garden can see multiple insects visiting the flowers. But it kind of has a uh, kind of um, interesting way of spreading its pollen. So what happens is the insects will go up to the plants and what happens is when they're sitting on the blossom that they, they, it has the rise and the falls they'll actually their, their, their legs will fall through the slits and in that slit a pollinitarium will be released and it's like a sticky pair of waxy pollen and it attaches to the legs. It can attach to the proboscis. And then the bees carry it to a separate plant. And so if you're a small insect and you can't free your leg, you might actually get stuck. So if you've ever gone up to a milkweed flower and there were little tiny insects stuck in the flower, this is the reason why. And then you can see lots of in, uh, pictures on the internet. Um, I love Alex Wild. Um, he, here is Alex Wild. He actually has a great picture that is a bee carrying a pollinitarium and it um, a pollinarium, and it is uh, a really quite a sight. So it's a, a great way for um, um, that plant to spread its pollen and make seeds. And we know that. Um, you know, uh, 
Now is a good time to collect milkweed seeds. Uh, you can break open those pods, put that floss and seed in a little cup with a quarter, and it'll knock all that floss off. And then you go ahead and you plant those seeds now because they actually need to be vernalized by the cool weather. Um, and then, you know, it, it goes to show that not only plants adapt, animals adapt, and um, monarchs being adapted to their caterpillars eating this plant that in, 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 in makes them poisonous um, actually um, is a great adaptation, but uh, it, not so great when we actually don't have as much milkweed to uh, um, keep the population going. Okay, and with that, I did it in under an hour, and that was my goal. But I also want you to look at plants differently and think about how they've adapted to their environment, maybe where their environment was, and think that actually can make you a better grower. If you know how a plant is adapted to its normal environment, then you can kind of recreate that environment. Um, I am always available by email. Um, I have a really cool blog called Flowers, Fruits, and Frass. Um, frass is insect poop um, because I like writing about insects also. Um, if you would like to uh, get on that site and um, click, put your email in or just read through it. Um, I love writing short articles about things that interest me through the summer. And uh, with that, does anybody have any questions? I also love being on Facebook. I have a Facebook page called Livingston uh, McLean Woodford Master Gardeners. And it is, um, um, I love sharing interesting articles, things that's going on in my, uh, my unit. Um, a lot of people, once they find out that I'm passionate about insects, they send me pictures of insects to identify all the time. However, I'm not an expert, but I'm good at researching it. And my background is I definitely was a greenhouse grower. And then I spent many years at the University of Illinois Plant Biology Greenhouse and Plant Care Facility um, growing different types of plants for classes while I was there. Kelly, there was a question earlier asking, what specifically is it that prevents the mangrove from getting air? Yes, the, it's the... Um, the salt water, the salt water is an, it, it's anaerobic, so it can't really get the air. So it's just like, um, it's just like, um, you know, when you have really, uh, when you have really wet soils, then they actually, like the uh, mangrove, not the mangroves, but the, um, the cypress trees push out those knees because they can't get the oxygen from the soil. Does that help? Here is my URL for my blog right here. Well, I definitely want to thank you for listening to my presentation. Feel free to email Kari, Candice, or Martha with questions or even suggestions for future presentations. And we really appreciate you uh, um, listening to this uh, Four Seasons Gardening, and I hope you learned a lot. And most of all, I hope you look at plants differently.
Would you repeat how to collect milkweed? Okay, um, if it is uh, a perennial milkweed, those pods are going to start open. That opening, that means that it's ready. So what you do is you grab those pods and you um, open up those pods and you'll see seeds that are connected to this white fluffy stuff and if you would sit there and try to manually remove it it would take you forever so you just put it in a cup with a quarter and the quarter knocks the floss off of the seed so we after you've you know agitated enough in the quarter all you'll have at the bottom is the seed and the floss will be more closely to the top and then you can just throw away that floss they actually used to make pillows out of that and then you're going to want to plant it now now it's not going to germinate now because it actually needs fertilization which means it needs to um, go through cold treatment um, if you were to wait and not plant that milkweed until the spring, you could put it in a wet paper towel in your refrigerator for two to four weeks if you're willing to give up part of your refrigerator. Um, we, we, blood flower is an annual tropical milkweed that has been really popular as of late, and that one I'm just collecting, and then I'll go ahead and plant it again in the spring but because it, it is an annual and not a perennial and then share with everyone because we need more milkweeds Okay, well, again, feel free to email Candace, Kari, or Martha with any of your questions or concerns or suggestions for future topics. And um, I'd like to thank all three of them because they do a very good job of helping us put on these webinars for you while you get to sit at home. And uh, thank you very much for uh, watching the presentation. And feel free to email me if you have any further questions.